So I want to pray. Father, thank you so much for this opportunity that you've given us here to be in your presence, to be in your court, to be in your meeting. You love your sons and daughters so much, those who are present and those who are watching via live stream. You're crazy about them. Goodness and mercy pursues us all the days of our lives. You chase us with your love. You chase us with your compassion. You chase us, Lord, with your hand to heal, with your hand to elevate, with your hand to lift, with your hand to affirm, with your hand to confirm, with your hand to guide. And so, God, we only have a little bit of time together. But in this time, I pray that you would put eternity's power in these next few minutes that we have together, God. Put eternity's wisdom, eternity's revelation, eternity's strength so that the apex of your creation the only being that you created in your very image and your likeness can be satisfied, can be enriched. Do that which only you can do. Enrich a soul, enrich a heart. Fulfill us and fill us. I thank you for the spirit of wisdom and revelation. I thank you for access to wells of insight that I might bring an awakening to your people. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you receive it already, just... <laughs> woo. I feel, the, anybody feel the Lord with me? Am I the only one expecting God to do something over these next 20 minutes of preaching, 25 minutes, 100 minutes of preaching? <laughs> Come on, anybody expecting for real? I know sometimes we can get in a season where we're, we're hoping, but do I have any expecting people? I, I just want you to release your faith just for a second and say, I'm going to get what God brought me here for. I'm not going to be denied in this place. Where are my hungry people? My radical. I, I'm looking for some radicals. I, I'm sorry. Where are my radicals? <laughs> we'll get there. I know it's not easy, but we're going to get there. I want to talk today about, uh, from this theme, what the cocoon won't tell you. What the cocoon won't or doesn't tell you. Let me just dive right into this. Um, there's no way to truly get to the next level of your life, the next dimension, the next chapter, the next God chapter of your life without going through a cocoon. We talk about the next level, we talk about a new season. We're inspired by the truth that we go from glory to glory and faith to faith. We're inspired by that. Oftentimes not realizing that there's no way around the cocoon to get you to that place. Hello, somebody. Wouldn't it be awesome if we can just go to the next level without having to go through a chamber of darkness? Hello, somebody. Because here is what you have to understand. A true next level will always necessitate a new you. And you cannot become a new you without going through a cocoon process to manifest that new you. It's impossible. You can't do it. So let's talk about the cocoon. The cocoon is a dark place. The cocoon is an awkward place. The cocoon is an uncomfortable place. And the cocoon often is a scary place. Because the form that you used to have is no longer. And the form that you shall have has not been made manifest. And so, if you look at the process of the caterpillar going through the cocoon and coming out a butterfly, the caterpillar, you know, it's, it's one thing to look at the, cal the caterpillar in the context of the butterfly. You can, you know, it, hindsight is twenty twenty. So you look at the caterpillar and you can say, that, that's nothing, just hang in there, go through the cocoon. But, but what if the caterpillar has never seen himself as a butterfly? What if all the caterpillar knows is how to be a caterpillar? I move around, 
It might be slow, but I get where I'm going. I can see it's not dark. I can feel the sun rays as a caterpillar. I can go about and I can eat and do my thing. And so I just want you to imagine yourself as a caterpillar right now. Okay? You've never become a butterfly yet. And every round from level to level and glory to glory necessitates a cocoon to butterfly experience. I promise you. And so you may be a butterfly on this level, but when you go to the next player, you're, the next level, you're a caterpillar all over again. So I want you to see yourself as a caterpillar. And so a caterpillar, so just imagine you're a caterpillar and you're getting by and you're moving a little slow and, you're, and you know that you need an upgrade. And the God of the caterpillars comes to you one day and says, Terry Caterpillar, I'm going to make you into something so awesome and so wonderful. I'm going to do exceedingly abundantly far above what you can ask for or imagine. And Terry Caterpillar would be like, hallelujah, and break out in tongues and everything. Sha -ba 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 -ba. <laughs> you tell your friends, you get excited, you praise the Lord, you'll bring an offering. Not realizing that the only way to get to the promise is the process of the cocoon. And so I go from being overly excited, super excited, full of joy. Full of expectation and anticipation because God has given me a vision that is greater than where I am. But then I look up and I'm in darkness. How did I go from totally being inspired, totally being motivated, having so much clarity and inspiration to now all of a sudden being in darkness. And not only am I in darkness, but when I'm in the, the cocoon, I don't even have the shape that I used to have, which means that I am formless. Because I'm not who I was. But then again, I'm also not what God showed me. And so I'm in this place of darkness. And there are things that you need to know about the cocoon that the cocoon, the cocoon will never tell you because the cocoon can only communicate in its context. And the context of the cocoon is darkness. And so if I'm not careful, I will begin to focus more on the process than I do the promise. Because the context of the cocoon is process and process alone. It's formless. When God is getting ready to create something new in you, and I might submit when God is getting ready to create a new you, there will always be formlessness and void. You remember a few months ago we talked about Genesis and how it says in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and then right after it says, and the earth was formless and void. Isn't that crazy? The process of creation is to go through a process of nothing. So God shows me something, but in order to get to the something that he shows me, I have to go into a season that looks like nothing. It's dark. And when you go from level to level and from glory to glory, oftentimes we as humans define ourselves or base our identity in what we do. Now, now follow me with this point. Who we are creates what we do. And then some sort of way, our identity is transferred from who we are into what we do. And the only problem with that is that when God is getting ready to do something new in you, when he's getting ready to manifest a new you, oftentimes he will alter or altogether remove what you do. And you can no longer find your identity 
which is our entry point into life, how we see ourselves. And so now we can no longer find our identity in what we do because what we do has been altered. And it makes us have to go back and start asking a better question. And the better question is, who am I? Oh, I feel God on this. I'm going to take my time right here. The, the concept of identity and the absence of a sense of identity is the worst thing that can ever happen to a human being. Because when you don't have a sense of who you are, a consciousness of identity and a consciousness of purpose, you will become a hater. You will be, particularly if you see someone living out theirs. And you'll think that the problem exists beyond you, and really the problem exists within you, because identity, consciousness, a sense of identity is what gives you peace. Are we together? And so the question that all of us need to always be able to answer is not what I do. And I know we live in a culture and a society and a time and, and you go somewhere and you meet somebody and one of the first things they ask you is what do you? So what do you do? And so as a result of, of human expectation and human projection onto you, you begin to say or regard yourself as a human doing and not a human being. When you being a human being is the most powerful thing that you can be. You are a being. God made you a being, not a doing. And just because some people are so shallow that they reduce you down to a doer. You can't let someone's expectations of your doing rob you of the power of the truth that you are an awesome being. And so when you go into a cocoon, when God sends you into a cocoon, it forces you to say, who am I? Oh, I promise you. There's some people right now, and you're looking for, you know, what to do next. And I challenge you, don't look for what to do next. Look to what to be next. Who, who is God calling me? To be because, because doing is like gravy. It comes automatic if you're a steak. I think. <laughs> the steak isn't overly consumed with the juice, a.k.a. gravy. The steak is like, I'm a steak, baby. Just keep heating me up. It'll come. Trust me. It'll come naturally. I promise you. I'm sorry. I, I, I'm hungry. I've been on this juice fast. I, every analogy will go into, will become a food. It, it's, so this cocoon family, I, I feel for you. I feel for you. I feel for you. I feel, and I want to describe it. I want to describe this, and because you're in a cocoon, and sometimes when you're in a cocoon, you know, there's just things that the cocoon doesn't tell you. The cocoon is a liar. It says that you're, 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 you're first of all, one of the things the cocoon says is that I am permanent. Right? The cocoon says I'm, I'm permanent. This, this, this is your new normal. And it's not true. And a cocoon is hoping that you'll die in it before you become a butterfly. Hey. No. A cocoon is temporary but necessary. Hmm. Who am I? Coon says that there's nothing around. 
cocoon, cocoon says you're not going anywhere. And when you get into this place of blackness, like in this cocoon, it gets so dark and it's so awkward. And you think you're going to stay awkward. See, a cocoon says that you are formless. The truth says you're being formed. Right? And so it feels like formlessness because, because you don't have the form that you used to have. Right? You're not a caterpillar anymore. And you're not quite a butterfly. And so there's an idea that says, because I don't have form, I am not being formed. I am formless and I'm afraid. And one of the things you have to understand about God, and, and there are a couple of passages of scripture that describe, one is in Isaiah 29, the other one is in Jeremiah 18. But it describes God as being the potter. I'm the potter. You are the clay. And the beautiful thing about God the potter, I know we know God the father, but do we know God the potter? The beautiful thing about God the potter is he is connected in eternally to his clay. And so even when he spins me in such a way that my form is altered to the point of unrecognized, un, to the point where it can't be recognized. I was going to say unrecognizability. <laughs> and my teachers were like, PT, I'm going to cut you some slack. But unrecognizability, I'm not quite sure you'll find in a dictionary. So when you get to a point where you, you have, you, you've lost your form and you don't, you don't recognize anything about yourself and you feel so vulnerable. Anybody ever been there before? And you just don't know you're not there anymore, but you're not quite there. And you, and you don't even, who am I? Even when the potter spins you to a place beyond recognition, what the cocoon won't tell you is that you're still on his will. That his hand is still on you. When you're without form, it doesn't feel like God's hand is on you because You've learned to only associate God's hand on you when everything is going right and you can recognize everything in your life. Some sort of way we have been programmed to say it's in, this, in, in those moments that God is with me. In other words, when I can understand perfectly everything that's going on, it is in those moments where I, Mr. or Mrs. God, can confirm it's almost like that's when we say, you're right. I, I agree with you, God. As if God needs our cosign. I, you know what? You're right. Mm, let me see. I feel this. I feel that. Okay, yes, God, you are with me. And it has nothing to do with how you feel. See, God wants some people here to know right now, particularly if you're in a cocoon season, that I know that it's dark and I know that you can't see anything and there's a part of you that wants to go back to being a caterpillar, caterpillar because at least you knew how to be a caterpillar. At least there was sunshine when you were a caterpillar. It wasn't quite the way you wanted it to be and it makes you forget that you pressed out of being a caterpillar to go into the next phase. Don't trust the commentary of the cocoon. It's temporary. And when you come out, you're going to emerge into the world that's outside of the cocoon that you can't see right now. Because your only context is the process, not the promise. And when you emerge from the cocoon, you're going to enter into the promise with a vantage point that you did not have before you went into the cocoon. And that is what the process was for. So that you can emerge and be something entirely different. Because let me tell you something. Here's the catch. You're going to need to be something different to go where God has taken you. I promise you, you need every second of this cocoon. You know, it's interesting. I talk about my book, Purpose Awakening, chapter 12. Shameless plug. So what? 
They're available outside. I talk about how this transformation has to, it literally has to go all the way. It has to work its process. It has to go to the end because there's a point where we know the end of the process of the caterpillar. It becomes, it goes to the cocoon and it becomes a butterfly. We know the end of the process, but did you know that there is a point in time in the middle of that process that if you were to cut the cocoon, if you were to, to cut it in half, literally, caterpillar mesh would ooze out of it. Oh, I feel it. Here's a word for somebody. Stop fighting the process. Just, 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 just learn how to live in it. And I know it's awkward and I know you feel vulnerable and I know it feels like you don't really fit in the universe. You ever been there before? Where you're in transition and you don't feel like you fit anywhere. Wait. Wait. Let the process happen. I promise you there is a home for the new you if you wait. And so as I was maybe going through my own cocoon season, I started asking God a question. And the greatest question you can ever ask the Lord is, who am I? I promise it's not what should I do. It's who am I? Doing comes from being. And he took me to Ephesians chapter 2, and I want to take you there. In verse 10, this is what you got to know in the cocoon season. This is what, what you have to know when, when you're trying to be who you were. But you have to acknowledge that you're in transition. You have to acknowledge that you're in a process. You have to acknowledge that you're not there yet. Can I talk to some real people just for a second? Have you ever not been where you're going and tried to pretend like you were cool? <laughs> How you doing? I'm all right. And you know you're not all right. Your insides are like being completely reworked and revamped. But somebody told you, you have to say, I'm cool. You need to have at least one person in your life that you can go to and pray and say, I am in the process. I am in a cocoon. I mean, somebody with some wisdom so that they can let you know what the cocoon won't tell you. And the cocoon won't tell you that there's a butterfly waiting to emerge. The cocoon, it's not the cocoon's job to tell you that. The cocoon is simply the process and you have to be connected to the one who made the process in order to who made the promise in order to endure the process. I better say that again. The process will never speak to you. The cocoon will never talk to you. It has one job, one mission, and one mandate, and that is to serve God in preparing you for what is next. So you can't look at the process for an encouraging word. It won't give you one. It's not its job. It's not its function. And so if you're so busy looking at the process, you will absolutely miss the promise. It's the promise that gives you the strength and the fortitude to endure the process. Nobody likes the process. I don't like the process. If I can get to the next level without the process, I'd say, God, skip the process. But I can't say that. The process is part of it. And so I have to keep my eye on the promise. Jesus didn't love the cross. Oh, cross. Oh. Oh. And I know we try to get real spiritual and all that kind of stuff. And Jesus just hugged the cross. No, he didn't. He hugged the promise for the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross, despising its shame, and is now seated at the right hand of the Father. I don't love my cross, but I understand it. I know there's no way around it. It's a process. I'm looking past it because I can't get to glory without it. Okay, so glory's over there? Yeah. Ain't no way around it. 
<laughs> you sure I can't? You know, how I many know God is too high to get over? He's too low to get under. And when you're stuck in the middle, <laughs> the pain is thunder. <laughs> And sometimes when you can't rely on what you do, oh, man, it's so deceitful. Uh, I'm, I'm going to go to this and I'm going to land the plane in just a second. But, but what we do is so deceitful. Oh, I promise you, it's so deceitful. We define ourselves by what we do, and it's deceitful because God will change that. Your purpose is never what you do. Your purpose is always who you are. I have a quote. It says, you'll never be a has-been if you learn how to reinvent yourself within the evolution of your purpose. The people who are have-beens are people who define themselves by what they do or did. And so they're trying to find new life in an old production. You follow me? And, and, they, and they become has-beens. They're trying to stay in the game. They become has-beens when there is a new manifestation and even a new heavenly expectation of you today that is fresh, that is current, that is, flo that, that is flourishing, that is powerful, but you can't get there if you're stuck in what you think you are to do. It has to come down to the question, God, will you please tell me who I am and who I am now. But I want to answer that question in one verse. And the beautiful thing about this verse is that you will be able to answer this question in every season of your life. And when you're able to answer the question, who am I, in every season of your life, it will give you peace whether you are in cocoon or promise. Because at the end of the day, you are a being. And if you can say, no matter where you are, high time, low time, if you can say, I am, you'll be fine. And so, Paul says something powerful here, and we find these words. To answer the question who we are, here it is. For we are his God's workmanship. <laughs> I love that word. You study this in its original language. It has the idea of the word product in it. We are God's product. We're God's production. We're here. We're his workmanship. That means that, that he's working right now. In the cocoon, he's working. In the promised land, he's working. In high times, he's working. In low times, he's working. He's working. You are his workmanship. God is working right now. I love that passage of scripture that says that God works all things together for good, for those who love him. Those are called according to his purpose. He is working. I know you can't see him. I know he's working behind the scenes, but it's happening. God is working. He is not sleep. And he's working on you. You are his workmanship. Your clay in his hands. Where is God? Sometimes when you can't see God, you just got to know he's working. Where is God? You can't see him because he's busy working. Busy holding you. Busy spinning you. Busy making you into everything he promised you. It says that for we are, I am, this is your confession, I am his workmanship. And God is not one. You know, I know humans, you know, oftentimes we start things that we don't finish. Don't get quiet on me now. Yeah. Some of us, there's some people in here right now, and you own 14 companies. <laughs> and have 72 web domains. For companies that you were going to start. Hello, somebody. Y'all getting real quiet. Someone's like, I'm not judging. I'm just telling you the truth, right? 
Some of us are, are, are people with many foundations and very few buildings. Are we still friends? One of the things you have to understand about God, I promise you, he finishes everything he starts, including you. <laughs> Philippians 1 and 6. He who has begun a good work shall complete it unto the day of Jesus Christ. That verb is in present perfect tense. It means that it's being perfected. It's perfect as it's being perfected. Because at every level is a perfection of the you for that level. But then guess what? You got to go into the cocoon again. You got to understand the process of creation. We talked about it before in Genesis. It says in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And then in the next verse it says and the earth was void and without form. What sense does that make? So in the process of creation, it mandates you and I going through a season of formlessness. And it makes sense if you think about it. How can I take on new form if the old form isn't destroyed? But it would be cool. you know. And the challenge is the only challenge is the real you has to exist throughout that process. It would be cool if God would like put you to sleep. When he's taking you from form to form because he has to create the you on the next level, it will be so wonderful if you were, you know, it's like, like surgery, right? The beautiful thing about some surgeries is that God, is that God, the doctor puts you to sleep so that you don't have to endure the process and you just wake up healed. You just wake up better, right? But in life, it doesn't work that way. There's no anesthesia in this thing. You have to go through the process of being open, split open, cut open, having your spleen removed, this pulled to the side. But how many of us know God is the best doctor in town and he knows how to put you back together again even when you're in seasons where you feel like everything on the inside of you is jumbled. This used to be over here. Now it's over here. My heart is coming out my back. But you have to trust him with the process. I hear God saying, I got you. Trust me, please. Don't give up because you don't feel your form. In that Genesis text, and we'll get here, I'm, you know, but in that Genesis text, in the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. That's wonderful. He creates the universe. That's wonderful. The process, as it begins to describe the process, it says void and without form. And then it says, and darkness was over it. It says, but the Spirit of God, come on, you remember that sermon? Was hovering over the face of the waters the entire time. The entire time when you were in darkness and see this is what the cocoon won't tell you while you are in darkness God is hovering over you he sent his spirit that executes and produces what he promised his spirit is hovering over you so you're not by yourself like you thought you were there's a dimension of God the spirit of God whose only assignment is to produce <laughs> Is to look after and perform the word that God spoke. So even when you're in darkness and you can't see it, you got to know. See, I've learned to trust his heart when I can't see his hand. I've learned to trust what I know about him when I can't feel his hand on me. I've learned to know that no matter what I feel like or no matter how awkward I am, maybe I don't feel his hand because his hand is fitting a part of me that I haven't even been introduced yet, introduced to yet. I've learned to not allow my awkwardness to cause me to make decisions about whether or not he's with me. So it says... For we are his workmanship, created. That word created carries the idea of fabricated. And it's interesting when it says that we are God's product. I was looking at that and, that, and there's an idea of we're his fabric, right? And, and some of my, my, my finest garments, right? You know, you have your staple pieces, you know what I'm talking about? Where you have one or two and, and you just do a few different things with them and people think you have a, this extensive wardrobe. So you spend money on the staple pieces, right? 
And a lot of the staple pieces that I have are not just one fabric necessarily. There's several textures woven together that produce this staple piece, this valuable piece. And that's how we are. And some of them, and interestingly enough, if I were to take one of the strands that, that, came, that, that, was, that made up this fabric, it would be ugly. Just take one out and be like, and just have that one by itself and make a jacket out of that and be like, man, that ain't it. That, Jesus is not in that outfit. <laughs> and what I'm getting at is sometimes you look at your life and you have no idea how God can make beautiful tapestry out of this strand, this, this season, this strand of your life. But when God gets finished with you in his process... You're going to have a beautiful coat of many colors like Joseph had, which was symbolic of the favor and the blessing and the, and the manifold ways God could bring blessing unto his people. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. You create it for good works. You're created to do awesome things. Some of you need to know, you know, the enemy is such a liar. Some of you need to know that you are created for good works, that you are good. I know that sometimes old time religion makes you bad in order to accept good. And I, and I, I may understand that a little bit, maybe, possibly, probably not, never, ever. <laughs> but the reality of it is you're good. We need Christ. And through Christ, we're ordained to produce good work. Some of you need to know that. Because there's some people in here right now, and you shy away from the things of God because you're like, I've been too wrong. Fruit of my life has been too. God can't. And, and, and it's, oh, I feel God on this. I'm going to just talk to you. I know it's not everybody. I want to talk to a few people right here. Somewhere in your mind, you can't even fathom. You're just like, Lord, just forgive me. Lord, if you just forgive me then I'll be satisfied not realizing that God can take the fabric of the things that you are afraid of and weave it into something so wonderful and beautiful that it can render blessing and an impact on this world greater than any goody two-shoe who has ever lived. Don't come at me telling me what you've never done. I don't want to hear that. I've been a virgin all of my life and I'm 42. That's wonderful. Praise the Lord for you. I, that's wonderful. There's nothing wrong with that. I, God bless you. That's awesome. You know, but I tell you what, I know some people, hello somebody, that have changed more lovers in their lives and underwear and are filled with the Holy Spirit now and God is using them so awesomely and powerfully to the glory of God because when God gets a hold of you, he'll use even the things that you were once ashamed of to do beautiful things in the earth. In God's workmanship, all things work together for good. In God's workmanship, Created in Christ Jesus for good works. That's who you are. See, that, see, that helps me to understand, even when I'm in dark cocoons, that God is with me. Why? Because he made me. And I'm anointed to do good works. And I'm, I'm called to do good works. I'm created. The real me is created in Christ to do good works. And so I'm just going to let God keep on creating me. I know I have to go through cocoons. I know I have to go through dark seasons. I know I have to go through formless times, but I'm going to keep letting him work. And the awesome thing is he will keep working. He will never forsake me. He will never leave me. He will never give up on me. He will never relinquish me. Goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. I'm clay. Okay, I'll admit, I'll admit, I'm clay. I'll admit, I'm formless. I'll admit, I'm not really happy. Because no one said that there would be happiness in the cocoon. I'll admit that. I'm formless. I feel void. 
you know. I don't feel my swag. I don't feel like I'm in the pocket. You know what I'm talking about? You know when, you, when you're in the pocket, you feel like, yeah, you, you got this. Guess what? You are just a few steps away from graduation. And what you need to understand about graduation is you, that you don't graduate into perfection. You graduate because you have perfected a lesser level. And now you have to go and be a novice on the next level. A formless, a formless, uncool, unorthodox, awkward, left hand shooting when you're right handed. Weird. Everybody wants to be cool. Can't get your hair to lay right. One piece. Can't get your clothes to fit right. Hello, somebody. See, when you're in that process, everything about you feels weird. I'm trying to land a plane. I'm almost there. All this is happening. But one thing I can rest in is that it's happening in your hand. It's happening in your hand. And you see it, you know it. You got me, right? For we are workmen, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. This is the beautiful part. Which God... <laughs> These good works, this new me that's doing new things, awesome things, powerful things, great things. You got to be the real you or you always settle for less. I feel that thing right there. There's some things, right? there's, there's some, uh, I'm trying to do this, but I, I feel it so strongly. There's some things that you want that are so beneath you. <laughs> and you're after them like crazy. You do anything for them. You're all desperate for them. <laughs> and they are so beneath you because you're trying to do above B. Beers do excellently automatically. Are you hearing me? Beers just flow at it. It's just, it's just who I am and it works and nobody else can do it like me. Hello, somebody. It's just, boom, it just is. It's like, yo, I don't have to. I'm not even a competitive person in my being because there's nobody on the planet at all, ever, that can even get in the lane with me in my being. But when I am in a doing, I'm competing. Oh, my God. Oh, they're getting ahead of me. Let me go. No one can ever get ahead of you in your lane because there's no one in your lane. But you can't be and run your race. You can't be a doer. You have to be in order to access your lane. I felt that so strongly. Let me finish that thought and we're here. We're done in like 50 minutes, you know. But what I saw was, was somebody, I, I felt you, you were tr you're trying to be, you're trying to do something, you're trying to, you don't know who you are, and you're, you're trying to do something, and you're, you're like, and you think that you'll find your being in the doing. And I saw you going after something that was less than you. And I mean going after it. And like, oh, I feel God. You're like all excited and bragging about it. And undiscerning people, unenlightened people are saying, wow, that's amazing. And you know what I say? I don't care. It's normal. It's mediocre. I need you to find out who you are. I need you to start asking the right questions and pursuing not a thing, but a being. And then when you do something out of your being, that's when you're going to get me excited. That's when I'm going to jump off and say, that, that's it. That's, I feel that thing for somebody. 
There's a that's it moment that's coming to you. And you're not going to find it through doing. You're going to find it through being. And I also say to you, don't fight the process. Don't fight it. What if Jesus fought the cross? Come on, somebody. One thing I say, he went through it on that cross, right? It's okay to go through it. There's one point in that cross where he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In other words, he's basically saying, ain't this some stuff? (laughs) But never did he say, I'm coming down. Never did he say, I'm getting off this thing. See, you can talk all the talk you want to. You can fuss all you want to as long as you stay in the process. Hello, somebody. You can cry and complain and talk trash. and all that. That's cool. I don't have any. Just stay there. Where is workmanship created in Christ Jesus? For good works, for good works, for good works. Let your light so shine before men that they might see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. See, your good works are not just normal things. It's not just doing some of the awesome things like feeding them. That's wonderful, that, but that's not the good works he's talking about. You're going to do that anyway. That's who you are. You're a good person. Anybody can do that, right? Good works are those things that God has empowered and endowed you to do that nobody else can do. And when you do them in excellence and when you do them in power, people begin to glorify your Father in heaven because they understand it is a supernatural endowment that could not have emanated from anything human. That's a good work and you're called to them. And that's what the cocoon process develops it says okay so you're 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 created you're god's workmanship he's always got his hand on you he's always spinning you no matter how you feel doesn't matter the truth is the truth you're in his hand he's working and he's taking the good and the bad and the ugly all of that he is working it together for your good and he says these good works just these good works that emanate from the authentic version of you the most authentic version of you this is the year of authenticity and i'm telling you what's going to work powerfully in this season of your life is you being 100 percent radically authentic Because that's what the power is. And these good works that will be produced and manifest out of your authenticity. It says, which God prepared beforehand. See, before you even showed up in the cocoon that you are lamenting, God had already prepared you for. But see, the thing is, see, it's possible for you to be prepared for something, but you to not know you're prepared. It's very possible. And so when that happens, when you have been prepared for something, and what lets you know that you've been prepared for something is when something shows up into your life. Because God will always pre-qualify you before he puts you in something that affects you. (laughs) Prepared beforehand, before the foundation of the world. You've been prepared. So you are prepared, but you don't know you're prepared And so you have to blindly walk out a season, watch this, until your preparation shows up. See, the cocoon isn't to prepare you. The cocoon is to manifest your preparation. Man, I wish I had about 30 more minutes with you. The process is to prepare you. I understand that concept, but it's not true. You've actually already been prepared. It says, which God prepared when? Can I, can I just, can I have a little freedom here? Can I just, you got to understand this. I know I'm going through and this is going to prepare me. I understand that that makes a, a little bit of sense, kind of. No, you're in it to manifest your preparation. You've already been prepared beforehand. God is not doing, this thing is not, it's not unfolding in front of God's eyes. It's only unfolding in front of your eyes. God has already seen it. He's already pre anointed it pre-prepared it and so if you're in it you've already been qualified for it it's crazy so your preparation manifests itself and then you're like oh my god i thought i was gonna die but i didn't you thought you were gonna die but god knew you weren't gonna die because before the foundation of the world he already saw you mastering what's in front of you and so your mind just has to come your mind just has to recognize that you, you are now in the natural mastering what God has already perfected beforehand in the spiritual. 
which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Okay? So God prepares beforehand us being anointed with an identity to do powerful things all out of our authenticity. And those things that he has ordained and anointed us to do that emanate from us being. He says that he has anointed us to walk in them. That word walk literally means to trample upon. And what this speaks to me, and we're landing the plane, is God is saying that beforehand, I have prepared a realm for you. I've prepared, prepared a dimension for you. I've prepared a space for you, God. I prepared a territory for you. I prepared an environment for you. And you are the atmosphere of that domain, of that dimension, of that environment, of that territory. Oh, I feel God. You are the air that fills up that territory, that domain, that realm, that atmosphere that embodies the good works that you were ordained to accomplish. <laughs> okay. Can I explain that and we'll be done? When God creates the universe and everything in it, you think about it, everything is broken down into territories. Even the solar system is broken down into territories. Territories of water, territories of land, cities, regions, everything, governments, all those things are broken down into territories. When God created you, when he planned you to be birthed, and manifest into this universe. He gave you a territory that will be both sustained and expanded by the good works, the God works that you do. He's given you influence. And he didn't give your influence to anybody else. So when it says here that everything that God has done beforehand... That he's ordained for us to walk in them. That means that we cannot be people who fail to dominate the spheres that have been given to us simply because we do not, we do not know where we're going. We're people who have to begin to walk. This is why God told Joshua in, 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 in the book of Joshua, every place that the sole of your feet shall tread upon I have given you what would have happened if they never moved then there would have been things that God had given to them things that were rightly theirs that because they were not walking they would not have realized and so what I'm encouraging you to do is to not allow the cocoon from to, to not allow the cocoon to keep you from moving. You have to begin to move because you don't know the boundaries of your territory. And if God has got you in a cocoon, it's because he's increasing you. And if he's increasing you, he's increasing your territory. And you do have more room to move than you think. And there is more to see. And there's more to accomplish. It's the prayer of Jabez. And you've been ordained 
For we're his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, mind-blowing works. Mind-blowing works. Mind-blowing works. Sir, in the white shirt, I can't help it. Here's what the Lord is saying to you. You're in, a, you're, you're in a season where God is getting ready to make things very clear. And you struggle with who you divinely are. And God is saying, I'm going to put that to bed. Because you're doing great, but there's, there's more in store for you. And it's going to happen. It's going to come out of your authenticity. And he's going to show you some things. And I hear the Lord saying, when I show you, believe me. When I show you, believe me. It's going to look crazy. And there might be some people around you who try to make small of it. But he's saying, when I show you, believe me, because it's going to happen. And that's going to be your distinction. And it's going to set you apart and catapult you in places that you can never imagine. In Jesus' name. And if that's for you, you catch it as well. So I land this plane with this. Land this plane with this. There are certain things that the cocoon won't tell you. Don't trust the cocoon. Cocoon is really not your friend. The cocoon is neutral. It's a servant of God. You can't look to darkness to try to find the light. You got to say, God, shine your light in my darkness. God's got his hand on you. Just because you feel awkward, just because things weren't as clear and as plain as they were yesterday means nothing. You're right where you're supposed to be. I promise you. You're getting stronger. See, the, the cocoon says you're formless. God says you're being formed. The cocoon says you ain't nothing but some clay. And God's saying you're clay becoming an incredible vessel. And I've got my hand on you and I'll never drop you. I'll never drop you. Even when you're spinning so fast, you feel like you're going to drop. It won't happen. Your steps are ordered by me. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. and He delights in his way. Though he fall, he won't be cast down because the Lord upholds him in his right hand. I want to pray for you. If you're here and God was speaking to you and you didn't even know you were in a cocoon, and maybe some of you did, but you didn't know. You just know that you've been feeling formless. You just know that, man, just things aren't, haven't been clear. And, and you've wondered, you really wondered, like, God, is your hand on my life? Because it's crazy and I feel vulnerable and I feel naked and I feel, I felt like, you know, it's just not... There's no indication that you're with me necessarily, not realizing that the fact that you're breathing means that God's with you. Sometimes when you're in that dark place, not only does it keep you from looking forward, but it keeps you from looking backwards, not realizing that if you look back, you'll see evidence from the past that will communicate to you that God is with you now. But that dark place is such a liar. It's such a liar. And so if that's you, you're here and you're in a cocoon, I want to pray for you. I want you to come and meet me here at this altar right now. If that's you, just, just, just come. God was speaking to you. You know it. I just want you to come right now and pray. So you thought you were by yourself. You're not by yourself. I want to pray for you. And if you don't have to leave, don't leave. Let's finish this whole service. This whole service will be done in 10 minutes. If you're here and you're in a cocoon, we're going to pray for you. We're going to pray your strength. can't trust it can't trust it can't trust it it won't tell the truth the context of the cocoon is always process process won't speak to you you just know that you're in a process and then you keep focusing on God but the process itself won't talk to you it's a servant of the plan of God the cocoon helps you it works for you but it won't speak to you you got to be able to look past it and not trust what it says oh man it's dark see when everything is light you see all the promises you see everything it's great but when darkness comes now what's in you has to come forth because you can't see anything now so you have to the bible talks about the eyes of your understanding in the greek it literally means the eyes of your heart that's when the eyes of your heart have to come on Eyes of your understanding. Your testimony has to come on. God will put you in seasons sometimes where you won't see his hand. And you just will have to rely on who you have been convinced that he is. And that he can't change. And so as you saw him as a good God in the, in the good times, 
Good God, when he was opening those doors for you, and I'm full of favor. See, that, that's, it's such deceiving. It's deceiving. Because God was never in the good time. He was always God. He produced the good time, but he wasn't in the good time. So you can't look for the good time to find God. He is. Good times, he is. Cocoon, he is. Process, he is. Promise, he is. But he's not in the process. He's not in the promise. Nor is he in the good times. He is God all by himself. With a unique and distinct personality, two traits of which are one, he is extremely trustworthy. And two, radically in love with you. And if you can just base your relationship with God on those two things, he is perfectly trustworthy. Perfectly faithful. And radically in love with you individually. You just know those two things, and that will get you through the process. And you can't lie. If you're here, and you don't know God, and you want to know, let me tell you something. I promise you, I'm not selling you my God. What I'm offering you is your God. You will know him for yourself. I promise you, I'm not worshiping somebody else's God. I promise you that. I'm worshiping my God, who I know. It would be insane, Marco. It would be insane for me to not worship him. It would be insane for me to not believe in him. Too much evidence. Too much evidence. I would have to go crazy to stop believing in him. Absolutely crazy. Be completely disconnected with everything in life. And maybe you're here and you don't have that connection yet. And that's okay. Maybe you're here because... You only have clues of God, right? Clues of God brought you here. You're like a detective. You're sniffing out clues. Let me tell you something. Those clues are going to turn to evidence. So if you're here and you don't know him and you want to know him, I want you to come and meet me as well. We're going to pray for you. And you're going to have evidence for yourself. And you're going to be full of faith. And you're going to be bold. And you're going to see crazy things happen. And you and God are going to partner in a way in your life like you can't imagine. And he's going to take you places and show you things you couldn't have imagined ever seeing. And it's going to never stop. It's going to never end. If that's you, I want you to come. The third point is invitation. If you're here and you need to come home, you're here. And maybe you have a self-induced cocoon. Because you just, you've been so away and you just, you just turn your back, right? You turn your back on God. Isn't it beautiful that you turn your back on God and then you turn around and he's still right there? I love that about God. I mean, I, I've turned my back on God. Like, okay, God, I'm going to do my thing. You know, and you look back and you think he's going to be way off down a distance somewhere. And you turn around and he's right there smiling at you. <laughs> How you doing? <laughs> so maybe you're here. And you're in darkness because you turn your back to the light and you say, you know what, I want to come back home. If that's you, I want you to come as well. We're going to pray for you. If that's you, just come. I see you. I see you. Just come. Just come. Just come. Yeah, we see you. We love you. We love you. It's on. Man, I love this family. I love this. I'm telling you. I'm seeing butterflies, right? Absolutely. Eagles and butterflies. Come on, let's pray, baby. Father, who are we? Like never before, we're asking that you reveal to us the mystery of all that you've placed inside of us. That you would shine a light into our cocoon until we recognize that you have not abandoned us. That even in this formless and void state that you are ever present, oh God, awaken us to your spirit. Help us to realize that even in our loneliest moments that we've never been alone that you are more faithful than any lover, more faithful than any opportunity, oh God. Teach us your ways. Help us to understand that there is goodness left inside of us, that though life tried to rob us of our hope and tried to rob us of our determination, that you've had an encounter on 614 North La Brea to remind us that your work is good, oh God. And so we ask that you would breathe into our cocoon until we live again, that you would breathe into our cocoon until we believe again, oh God. Breathe into our cocoon until creativity returns, oh God, until passion returns, oh God, until 
curses are broken, oh God, until we must forgive, until we must move on, until we must lift our heads and lift our eyes to you, oh Father, show us who we are. Not what we've gone through, not what we've survived, not our scars nor our mistakes, oh Father, but who you predestined us to be. Show us that we have been prepared for this moment, that there is preparation in every step, oh Father, and so I ask that you bless the soul of every foot in this altar, oh God. That these feet would be empowered to tread in their territory. That they would discover their lanes like never before and that they would run, oh God, and not grow weary for they understand that they have been called for such a time as this, oh God. And if they don't do it, who will? Raise us up, oh God. Give us courage to be called. Give us courage to stay in our cocoon and not to resent the pressure that comes with that. But to recognize that you've set us apart, not to destroy us, not to isolate us, but to show us that you've been with us. And so, Father, I ask that you continue to hover, that you would continue to lead us and guide us, that you would awaken every good and perfect thing within us, and that those good and perfect things would have seeds that take root and develop fruit, O oh God, that the world would come to know that the glory of God exists within us, O oh God, and that you can use even the most broken people. And so I thank you for the imperfect vessels at this altar, for the imperfect vessels that are in this theater right now. For it is through their imperfection that your strength will be made perfect. And so I stand in victory right now celebrating these survivors, oh God. Celebrating the wings that are being formed, oh God. Celebrating the wind that is going to carry them from level to level. Oh God, I thank you that we've crossed into another dimension and that there is no devil in hell that can stop us. Not even the devils we created in our own mind can overcome the power of God that exists within us, oh God. Breathe life into these people, oh God. Breathe life into these cocoons. And we know that when you do that, that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that something took place inside of us that the world couldn't take away from us. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. He loves us so much.